I'm Dr. Lisa Knowles with Intentional Dental Consulting, and I have an honored guest today, Dr. Howard Ferran, who I will be interviewing about his new book called Uncomplicate Business. Well, this will be on uh, my blog post as well as a YouTube channel. So thank you so much, Howard, for being here today. I know you're a lecturer, you have your own media company, now you're an author. Is there anything else I missed? A dentist? Anything else I missed in the, that you want to share in, in your intro just bio? A father, just a father of four boys, uh, Eric, Greg, Ryan, and Zach, who are 20, 22, 24, 26, and the oldest one gave me a three-year-old granddaughter. So uh, that's uh, that's probably half my time. Then the other half, uh, I still practice dentistry, still lecture, um, just love, love all aspects of dentistry and my boys. Uh, in the great state of Arizona, the warm state, right? Oh, my God. Except it's so today, crazy. maybe. I woke up this morning to go work out at 5 o'clock, and it was 45 degrees. Yeah, that's like Michigan weather right now. So, But we oh, have 3 to 5 God. inches coming in Michigan this weekend, supposedly. So you're going to skip that. You can be happy about that, right? Right. <laughs> well, I know you're busy. We're going to jump right into your book, if you don't mind. And I have some questions uh, for you about your book, and I just loved it. Um, I loved the feel of it. I'm a book reader. I, I try to be an e-reader, and I do a lot of online reading, but there's still something about a book I like, and uh, I just enjoyed your book, the feel of it, the, all of it. it was nicely done, so I appreciate that. Um, so after I read your book, one of my favorite lines um, from the, the book was a quote you paraphrased from an American proverb, uh, love many, trust few, and paddle your own canoe. Uh, tell me why you chose that uh, line and why you think that's so important for uh, anyone in the, the business world today. Um, actually, the whole book started when I had my granddaughter. And I'm 53 now, I was 50 years old, and I looked at my granddaughter, and I realized, you know, the circle of life, you know, I had kids, and now the oldest mm -hmm. kid's having a kid, and so I know that on the circle, you know, I'm the next one out, and my dad uh, died at 60, and both of my granddads died at 60, and I was sitting there, and I was realizing, I thought, um, I had lived half a century, and um, by the time Taylor was 10... If I went out the same time my dad and grandfathers did, you know, I should only be 10. And if I made it 10 years past, that should only be 20 and might not be ready for this stuff. And so I really thought what I wanted to do is I wanted to write a, um, a magnum opus of everything I'd learned in half a century to little Taylor. And I didn't know what business she would be in. I didn't know what she would, you know, she could be a farmer, a plumber, a dentist. I didn't know what she'd be. And um, so when I thought about that, you know, I... I I, I, I looked at every column I'd written from 94 to 2015, and I looked at everything I'd learned in my MBA and all that, and, and I realized that business is business, doesn't matter what you do, it's just people, time, and money, and I think 80% of it is people, and I think, in answer to your question, um, love many, trust people, powder your own canoe, um, people are, you know, I, I don't mean to be rude or anything, I mean, pe people think they're these magical, mystical things, but they're... At the end of the day, they're talking monkeys. <laughs> and this, this planet, which travels around the sun once a year, has seven billion talking monkeys. And they, you know, they call themselves humans. And they, 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 they claim they know the guy that made the entire universe. And, you know, and, and of course, it, it's a human just like them. It looks just like them. And, and it's always a man. And they know his name. And they say all these things. And, and the reason people let you down... It's because you hold their expectations too high, mm -hmm. and if you realize that you don't, you don't, your your dog and your cat never let you down because you have no expectations for them. <laughs> you go to the zoo and you don't yell out to the giraffes, "Hey, you lazy giraffe, get up and do." I mean, you have no expectations for all the other animals on Earth, yeah. but you raise all these crazy expectations for your friends and family, which you even have higher expectations for than a stranger that lives across the street from you in the apartment next door. And, and you do love many. I, I love them all. Mm -hmm. And you do um, trust few. But at the end of the day, you better paddle your own canoe. And if you're going to get to the um, end of your journey and say, well, I didn't do this because of Sally, and I didn't do this because of my mom, and I didn't do this because of my sister. You know, you know how many dentists told me, well, you know, if my wife would help me more in my office, I'd be successful. And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> I mean, you, 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 weren't, you weren't dating your wife. And marrying your wife because she was going to be the most rocking hot office manager. I mean, just right. paddle your own canoe and, and be um, my, my favorite Michael Jackson song, "Man in the Mirror." Oh, you know, me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, look, look at the man in the mirror and and um, lower your expectations of everybody around you 
raise the expectations of yourself, not compared to anyone else, but of who you were yesterday. And if every day you can just be a little bit better of a man in the mirror than the day you were before, whether that's your weight loss, your dental office production, your relationships, and just just take responsibility. Yeah, yeah, awesome. I, I that resonated with me too. Is you, we we can so easily fall into the blamers category of somebody else's issues. Somebody else didn't create my success, and I loved that the paddle your own canoe. I hadn't heard that before. I'm sure it's some famous American and, proverb that and, I. And, but I, and we just, see that we see that in dentistry all day long. Every consultant will tell you, you know, what only one percent of the seven billion Earthlings live in a country they weren't born in. And the immigrant dentists that come here that were not born in the United States, every consultant will tell you if they graduate from dental school and they were not born in the United States, they're already three steps up the stairway. And you come back five or ten years because whatever that kid had to make it from Asia to the United States and get out of dental school, I mean, they're already halfway up the stairway. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so... <clears throat> Definitely important. So another part of your book that stood out to me was when you um, discussed where to open a practice and how you went through that and decided to get to Arizona. Um, and for me, when I was trying to figure out where to open a practice, I kind of narrowed it to Michigan. Um, it seemed just insane to open or buy a practice where all these other dentists were for for um, for Michigan Ann Arbor's like the pipe dream because you've went to school there a lot of us and it's just kind of a it's a great city but there's it's so saturated with dentists and I thought wow I don't I don't think I really want to be there unless of course it's a growing population and there's some things to that might make it a good reason to go to a, a highly trafficked area but apparently you kind of felt the same way I was hoping you might be able to walk me through and some of the dentists who are out there right now trying to figure out go through some of that data collecting of where did where did you go? And I mean, I know it's a while ago, but um, I'm sure you have some insight into that. As did you use the ADA? Did you use national data collection things? How did you figure out where would be a good spot to land for your dental practice? Well, you know, um, business in three words is supply and demand. And you graduated, and you're going to learn how to make a supply of root canals, fillings, and crowns. And you're going to need people to demand it. And you need to go where they ain't. And <laughs> and and you know, that's go where you ain't. And so I was born in Wichita, Kansas, and back to these immigrants. I mean, I mean, look how smart 1% of the population of the planet, 7 billion humans on Earth, and only 1% stands up and says, you know what, I bet there's some place better than this. And I asked Dennis, would you graduate from dental school and go to Tanzania? Would you, go, would you, would you graduate from dental school and go to Syria or Somalia? Well, if you know you wouldn't go to Somalia or Tanzania or Ethiopia, why the hell... Do you not look at the United States of America? In fact, I think the United States of America, I, I, that, that, that is the most confusing term in the world. Because when you look at Europe, nobody compares Germany to Greece. <laughs> nobody compares Italy to France to England and, and all that stuff. But the United States, I mean, how do you, you know, when, when Dennis told me, oh, yeah, I visited your country. And I'm like, really, where'd you go? And they go, oh, I went to the Greater New York Dental Meeting. I was in Manhattan for seven days. I'm like, wow. And then you talk to them, they, they think, that's America. And it's like... <laughs> Manhattan isn't even a rounding error. I mean, when right. you grew up like me in Kansas, I mean, you certainly didn't take in America right. if you went to Manhattan. I mean, I can remember the first time I went to Manhattan. I was 27 years old. It was my first lecture. It was August 21st, 1990, and I mean, I was stunned. I mean, I, I remember looking out the window with uh, my dentist friend, Craig Syke, and we were looking at the window, and we were just going like, wow. I mean, it looked like an inverted Grand Canyon. So when I, so I was in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, most people consider Kansas to be the armpit of America. Uh, the tallest thing was a grain silo. Uh, the population had never changed uh, of anything I'd ever seen. It had always been 280,000. The joke was that whenever a girl got pregnant, a guy left town. <laughs> and so <laughs> I wrote, um, so I was visiting um, probably um, half a dozen dentists regularly that went to the University of Missouri Kansas City Dental School. And then I was visiting another six or so uh, regularly that went to Creighton because those are the two dental schools and you needed letters of recommendation and all that stuff. And from the sixth grade to the end of dental school, they were all telling me they all had their incomes on deal. And they were all showing me how every year their incomes had gone down for 10 or 20 years because those blankety blank, 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 blank dental schools just keep letting out another class. And, and they would always tell me, they'd say, you know, this, this population never changes. And every year, 30 more dentists come in from UMKC. They should shut that school down and blah, 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 blah. And so, so I saw all the charts of, you know, here's the city, constant population. 
every year another class comes out, every year the total income goes down. So I wrote senior year, this is before computers, there were no laptops, smartphones, I, I wrote the um, Washington DC at the Department of Economic Security and I said, what is the economic projection for the United States? And they sent me back in 87, their, at the time they had the 85 study and they said from 85 to 2000 the United States would create like 30 million new jobs and half of them would be in five markets, uh, Boston, Tampa, Phoenix, Orange County and and Silicon Valley, and I'm like, okay. So then I looked at those five cities. I didn't want the cold of Boston. I didn't want the insects of Florida. And and truthfully, this sounds so bad to say, but I'll say because it it's how you feel when you grow up in Kansas. I thought everybody in California was like on drugs and nuts, and I, there was no way I wanted to get married and have children. And I just didn't think you could possibly raise great children in the crazy state of California. So then I looked at Phoenix. So then I just wrote Arizona, and I wrote their Department of Economic Security, uh -huh. and they sent me um, the six-year um, street plan of where they were going to um, widen the streets. They sent me the six-year water plan of where they were bringing in a two-foot water pipe. Um, they sent me um, the um, projections of housing permits. So I got a six-foot by four-foot map. I traced out the 303 census tracts. Um, we had index cards, little recipe cards. I don't even know if your viewers even know what a recipe card or an index card is anymore and with, with a number two pencil. And I made a card for each one of those and I just started with how many dentists per thousand. Mm -hmm. And it started at the top of the list with a dentist per 6,000 and the bottom quarter inch of the stack was a, a dentist for 500. And so I saw two zip codes that had dentists for 6,000. Both of those zip codes were um, issuing 90 housing permits a month. And um, so I just realized that for me and my future family, it was worth moving a thousand miles away from Wichita, Kansas to mm -hmm. Phoenix, Arizona, where two of my mom's brothers had retired. Mm -hmm. um, so my mom's uh, two older brothers, uh, um, Chick and Pat, had already retired out here. So I had family and um, I came out here and um, I, I, I signed up where where they ate, where, where there weren't any dentists, and where it was growing. And and it was amazing because I would go in this town, and and there was, I'll never forget, there was a 6200 South McClintock, and there were like 30 dentists in one building. And you're just thinking, well, what are you thinking? And then, and then and the worst, um, um, I, I should pull that up. Um, can you pull up my, uh, my uh, but it's downtown San Francisco. There's a building. Have you, have you seen that? Um, Oh, I'll pull up uh, uh, no my uh, anyway uh, yeah I should pull up my uh, summer slide but there's a building in downtown San Francisco that has a hundred dentists in one building uh -huh. I, have, I have I have a picture of it and you just and 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 they'll blame it on Obama they'll blame it on the economy it's you know it's the gold standard it, it's it's every single thing known to man and then and then look at the geniuses in our lifetime look, look at the first dentist that i know of that became a billionaire was rick workman of heartland dental mm -hmm. he was he was doing another genius thing which i recommend he was calling the insurance company to say okay you sell insurance dental insurance to everybody in the great state of illinois do you ever get complaints from the people with the insurance that say there's no dentist provider and these insurance companies like Connecticut General telling Rick, oh yeah, here's 10 towns that don't even have a dentist. They all have like 2,000. That was the Walmart war. Sam Walton and his wife Helen realized that Sears, Gibson's, Teaching Y, J.C. Penney were not going to go to small town America. And they were in Bentonville. And Sam went all the way to J.C. Penney, all the way to Gibson, said, you know, I don't want to put my life savings in a store if you're going to come in there. And they go, where are you from? And he said, Bentonville, Arkansas. And they just laughed. <laughs> like, who the hell would go there? Because they were supposed to order out of a Sears catalog. And if you're a rural farmer, all you get is a catalog, but you got to be an urban city slicker to be able to walk into a nice store. And um, and that's what Rick Workman did. Rick Workman basically took Sam Walton's uh, cheat sheet and just started calling the insurance. So what I would do, if, if I wanted to practice in Michigan, first phone call I'd make, I'd walk into Delta Dental and say, you sell state contracts for police and fire and teachers and all these they kind of where are your complaints from and they just tell you in mm -hmm. fact um some of these states like iowa is doing a genius program where i delta dental of iowa you know they got skin in the game they're selling insurance and there's no providers these small towns so they're going to small towns and they're saying to the mayor okay you go to first street and maine and half the buildings are boarded up so you give me a free boarded up building and kick in a hundred grand Delta will match what you kick in a hundred grand, 
And then we'll go to the dental schools and say, hey, you come here, you get a free building and 200 grand off your student loans. And they're just signing them up right and left. That's and awesome. It, 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 then, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to get them on a, on a, um, to write an article or a podcast or whatever because that's the model. We'll, we'll, we'll get rid of so much misery if we just make right. sure these new graduates are going where they ain't. And, and it fulfills the access of care issue, too. I, I mean, if, if you look at it, it, to me, when we try to keep having more and more providers and we claim the access to care, access to care, I, I, I think it's an access to where we have too many people. <laughs> it's a it's a distribution issue sometimes more than a, a, an access Absolutely. to care issue. So um, I think we I just mean, have to be you, more creative, I, and that's a great way innovation is helping out that situation. So awesome. I mean, it's, it's funny. Sometimes you'll be with a dentist in Manhattan, and they'll say, wow, that's crazy. Look, there's a Starbucks on three of the four corners and I'm like well first of all each one of those corners is at the bottom of a 40-story building and if you went in that building there'd be a Starbucks on the 10th floor and the 20th floor too but more importantly why would that surprise you because medical dental buildings are still the norm in dentistry and and there's there's eight nine ten dentists in every one of these buildings and you never see eight or ten Starbucks in a building you never see have you ever seen a triple decker McDonald's where there's just three McDonald's stacked on top of each other <laughs> right no but you but you'll yeah. see in dentistry all day long yeah it is interesting oh. so <clears throat> I'm gonna switch topics here something else that caught my eye in your book I think is an uh, interesting part of it is when you talk about your hiring and firing methods and you you talk about George Steinbrenner, and um, you know if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. The dentists complain about it's not the dentistry we do; it's the it's the management of the team and the staff and the human resources. Um, so you recommended being like Steinbrenner and and how he picked his pitchers and and not think about how long a team member has been with you, but rather you must ask um, what the team member is doing for you now and make the hard decisions as necessary. How would you recommend a new dentist acquire these hiring and firing skills and how should they look for the best team players in the world? Kind of like a Steinbrenner approach or a Howard Ferran approach. Well, I, I think the um, I, I think the most difficult thing of a human being is that at the end of the day, we're genetically a, a social pack animal. I mean, we're no different than you know uh, cats and dogs and monkeys and apes. So you, but so we all have to get along. Like a shark just swims to the ocean, doesn't ever need his mom or dad again. He doesn't need to smile. He doesn't need a buddy. He doesn't need a, um, three other sharks to take down a fish. They, they don't need anybody. So it's a completely different animal. So a human is hardwired that every relationship they're in, they're either submissive to the 400-pound gorilla or they're dominant to the 100-pound gorilla if they're 200 pounds or whatever. And so we're just always trying to get along. And George Steinbrenner was is probably known as just the most consummate. Um, well, I don't want to. I don't want to use the, the the word I was thinking on your uh, on your YouTube video. But I mean, he, he he didn't get any awards for being charming and handsome and nice no. and, and all that. He, he was he was an ass. Uh-huh. And the, the bottom line is, if George Steinbrenner thought that there was another pitcher at another team that was just slightly better than Lisa, what would he do to you? You're out of here. See. Yeah, and, and, and he wouldn't even call you. Your your husband your husband would bring you the paper the next morning and say, Lisa, you've been <laughs> traded to the Royals. I mean, I mean, and then they'd be like, oh, my God, I can't believe that last year I got the this award and this award and this award, and he traded me. He didn't even, he didn't even talk to me. And, and, you know, when the Patterson rep walks in, when the Shine rep walks in, when the when the um, Benko or Burkhart rep would come in, and I, I would say to them, I'd be 24 years old, and I, I, I couldn't go teach a hygienist to be the greatest hygienist in the world. I mean, I graduated in dental school um, May 11th of 1987. I was 24 years old. I got my office open September 21. I mean, I'm 24. I wanted the best hygienist, and I would ask them, who who do you think is the best? Um, <clears throat> my assistant, Jan, worked for a very famous um, dentist who still teaches uh, continued education and hands-on. Um, oh, my mind's drawn a blank. He's in uh, Scottsdale. Um, lectures all the time. Um, oh my gosh! I can't, I can't help you out. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe his um, name. But in, anyway, she said, "Well, well, I think she's the best." I, I called her up and and I just said, "You know, I want you to come work for me." And she said, "Well, you know what? I'm not feeling appreciated. You know, I I've been here a long. I've been here eight years and everything. And and you seem like uh, you're." teachable and humble and trainable 
and I just always wanted the best. And one my my third hygienist I hired was Missy, and Missy, we well, were all sitting there working, and this woman walks in, and she just walks right past the patient waiting room. And she just starts walking around the dental office and just like like she owned the place, and everybody's like, "May we help you? May I help you?" And she's like, "Hi, I'm Missy." And I, anyway, long story short, she was a hygienist that worked somewhere else and saw this new office and just wanted to check it out and everything. I didn't need a hygienist. I already had two. I started talking to her and I realized, my God, this is the smartest, most enthusiastic, most amazing. I thought to myself, would you rather this girl be in your office playing on your team or would you like to have her, would you like to play against her for the Mm -hmm. next 40 years? And I just Mm -hmm. said, man, I I don't have room for you, but I'll make room. I mean, I'll I'll just put in another operatory. And for me, um, I'm not into titles. My president, um, she doesn't have a college degree. She didn't have any. It's just that attitude. It's mm-hmm. that It's that you give them a problem and they solve it. Mm-hmm. Where everyone else, you give them a problem and they come back tomorrow and they give you three reasons why they couldn't do what they had to do. And some people wake up in the morning and they got you know this Godzilla problem. Then they got some little lions and tigers and some little ants or termites. And what do they do? They wake up in the first hour. They check their Facebook status. And then they work on the ants and the termites. And they never even get around to. And, and then there's another breed of cat that you wake up and you say, okay, well, I'm ready to start the day. What's the most productive damn thing I could do today? And there's Godzilla just looking at you. And you just go after that. And it's just a mindset, and I, uh, I've always spent 80% of my time uh, right now um, on employees. In fact, right now, I got um, about 55 employees, and probably every three months when I'm in a good place, and I'm really happy, and I'm mellow, and I'm not hungry, I'm not tired, I'm not, 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 and I just sit down, and I look at each one of those players, and I just think, okay, is this the person that dove for the ball and won the game or is this the one that always throws the interception and loses the game because i believe that every single employee there, there's no there's no such thing as a neutral employee every one of them makes you money or loses you money yeah. and if you just get 55 people diving for the ball 55 people that just solve the problems and, and then I, I also look at it like how much are they how much do they come to me for ideas? How much do they come for me to solve their problems? Because I always think of management from the grave. I mean, Ray Kroc is dead and 40,000 McDonald's make a Big Mac without him. Sam Walton's dead. Nobody at Walmart's asking where Sam is. Yeah. And so I'm just sitting here thinking, okay, I give you money and then you ask me for the answer. I give you money. I give you a problem. <laughs> then the next day you come to me with why it can't be done. I mean, why am I on dental town? trying to find the ultimate recalls. Why, why do the hygienists come ask me, well, what kind of recall system should we use? It's like, well, you're a hygienist, not me. Why aren't you on Hygiene Town? Why aren't you on Dental Town? Why didn't you come to me and say, hey, there's three major hygiene recall systems, and here's the thought leaders of that, and this is what we're doing, but I really want to try that. I'll take that person yeah. any day over somebody asking me what to do. I liked your analogy in your book about the diving for the ball. I've played basketball, and uh, you know, you just they're just those team players, you, the ones that watch the ball dribble out, and then there's the ones that dive for the ball. I love that analogy, and you're right. And uh, you know, it is tricky finding those spots. Uh, sometimes when you park yourself where they aren't, um, it's a little harder to find uh, some of those people, but they're there and. Uh, it just takes a while in the hiring process sometimes to find those ones that were on a dive for you. So, um, so you've had no trouble if you if you find those people. You got to let them go. Or I mean, if you don't find those people, uh, clearly I'm sure you've hired a few that didn't dive for the ball and you had to let them go. I think that's a really hard thing for some dentists to do. This obligation, this caring persona we have um, to let people go. So, any any comments about that? Yeah. The, um- most dentists, uh, I think the most competitive sport, I think it's funny that you're a dentist to play basketball because they call that the non-contact sport. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the player that's always coming in with their tooth knocked out. Right, And right. then football is a full contact sport. I don't think I've ever replaced a yeah. missing tooth. They just break their football. collarbones. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think it's funny. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. To call basketball a non-contact sport, you couldn't be a dentist to say it. But, you know, the NF- I think the NFL is the most competitive game. I mean, it's the number one in revenue. I mean, they're doing about $11 billion a year. Everybody's backseat driving them. The whole media covers their sport for free. They don't have to pay a penny in marketing. They got all these cons- – everybody has an opinion on the NFL. And those guys have 25% turnover a year, 25%. Wow. So then you go to a dental office, and he's got two assistants, and he's got two hygienists and two receptionists. 
and two of them, I mean, they'd almost have to burn the practice down to get fired. And they're just like, well, you know, she's been here six years, and I know she's crazy, and she hates her job, and she's burned out, and she hates her. It's like, what does she have to do to get fired? I mean, and, and, and the reason you accept it is because you're a social animal. You're hardwired to get along. It's like it's like my analogy. Um, um, my mom and dad were very staunch Catholic. We had to go to Mass 100% of all mornings our entire life. My two oldest sisters left high school, went straight to the nunnery. Mm-hmm. You never, I never witnessed one person ever standing up in the middle of mass saying, "Excuse me, uh, I don't agree with anything you just said." Or there, there's no argument, there's no debate because you're hardwired to. That's the 400 pound gorilla, and you ain't that yeah. person. And sit there and shut up. So you go into your office, and you know this staff member is crazy. You know um, she doesn't play well with others. In fact, Ryan, will you give me my um, my core values um, on the deal there? Um, this is what I walk up to my player. Everybody has this. It's a little bitty sheet. You know, I walk up to them all the time when, when, I, when I'm coaching. I'm just saying, okay, here's my 12 commandments. You know, the, the Catholic Church taught me 10 commandments, and I didn't agree with uh, I didn't agree with the number 10 because I thought it was a lot of redundancies, like um, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not cover the neighbor's goods, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not cover the neighbor's wife. I, I thought there was actually only six original commandments, but I came up with 12. Are you creating a fun, positive, and professional environment? In what letter grade would I give you on that? Are you passionate, enthusiastic, and determined to make a difference? Are you humble? There's just no room for arrogance. Are you embracing and driving innovation? I don't care that you worked for a dentist 12 years that always did it this way. I, I, I don't care. Follow the golden rule. Do you know the golden rule? Treat other people like you'd want to be treated. My oldest sister, who's a cloistered Carmelite nun, who's read every single religion, said that is the only one line that's in every major religion. There's not a name of a city, person, place, nothing is in Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Judaism, Islam. The only thing you will find in every major religion ever written was treat other people like you would want to be treated. Um, Mistakes will be made. Be accepting or accountable. Move forward. I mean, I don't, I mean, risk equals reward. I want all my team to make mistakes and they'll learn and uh, never stop learning. Be honest and respectful. Integrity is everything. Balance life and work and fully present both. I It's a pet peeve of mine when a dentist won't let any of his staff take personal phone calls and gets mad when they do, yet after every patient goes back there and calls his wife. It's like, well, if my assistant needs to talk to her husband about little Billy, I mean, treat other people. You can't take a personal phone call if she can. And if she needs to talk to her husband, she needs to talk to her husband. Strive to make everyone feel safe, valued, and important. Do you know how many lab men tell me weekly, monthly, that they'll get an impression from a doctor and they're afraid to call because they don't want to lose the $5,000 a month account because they're not humble. They're arrogant. And when I'm sitting on airplanes and I lean over to a person I say, Hey, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm writing a paper. Um, if you had to describe a dentist with five adjectives, five adverbs, whatever, what, what would you describe it? They never say humble. They, I mean, it, it's never been. It's, it's usually arrogant, cocky, conceited, know-it-all. The labs, all the labs are afraid. When I got out of school, when I sent my lab in, it was this, everybody told me this German guy, he was like a, you know, schooled in Germany, and they told me that he was the best guy, and he was from Germany. So I sent him my impression, and I called him up on Friday and said, uh, "So, it, 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 am I good? I mean, do, do, you, do you like my work?" And he's just like, <laughs> you know, he's a, he's like, no, and I, and he, he said, "Well, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, well, what, what do you think?" And I said, "Well, I, they say you're the best, and I'm 24. I mean, am I good or not? Is there anything you want me to change?" And he said, "You know what? Maybe you should just come down here." And I went down there, and, and once he sensed that I was humble yeah. and truly wanted to learn, then he could nicely tell me I was the worst dentist that he was working with, and I didn't give him reduction, you know, and, and, and so once I reached out to said, help me, um, and then uh, back to the commandments, number 11, be remarkably helpful, and the last, create opportunities to make our customers feel special. And if you, if you master leading the people and you hold their high expectations and you get that right the time the money the marketing i mean i mean Mm -hmm. like right now i'm talking to you i got 50 people making decisions making things happen i don't need to micromanage and and what's funny is the dentist won't delegate today but 
they'll definitely gonna die. I mean, just ask all your clients. Uh, do any of you plan on not dying? <laughs> right. right. Our succession planning in dentistry is not always so well thought out. <laughs> like, where's where's the operation? Where's the what's the system? You know, a lot of times I go into an office and I, there's nothing. And, and I, I think, well, what if? Uh, I think you alluded to it, and you the hit by the bus or truck or something like that too i was like that's what we do too i mean like uh, everybody has to have you know you're doing damage to the team you're doing damage to the patient care if you don't have a plan in place so i i can appreciate that so much um i want to go out and uh, there's a, a poem that you recited in your book um it's called anyway by kent keith and it was said to be hung in mother Teresa's children's home in calcutta um it was. It, it struck me as so um, powerful that I was hoping you might even just be able to read it for us today and just give some people something to think about. Because you know, we, we all get caught up on our little, um, oh, I shouldn't do this, or I won't want to do that, or they did this to me, blah, blah, blah. And it was such a great poem. So I'd love for you if you could read it. You know, I just want to say that when you grow up Catholic, you know, Catholics are big into saints. And they always have these saint stories. You know, and it was like St. Francis of Assisi or all these saints. But my two favorite people out of the Catholic Church, the two biggest role models was Martin Luther, Mm -hmm. who stood up to the Catholic Church and wrote his 96 things he had wrong with him and nailed it right on his door. And, you know, they tried to kick him out and kill him. And his wife was actually a nun from my sister's same order, a Uh cloistered Carlite nun, who hit him in a wine barrel and snuck him all the way to England just so he wouldn't get killed. And the other one was Mother Teresa, who just um, um, moved all, and I, I got to see her birthplace, and um, gosh darn it, was it, um, well, the, the, the cities, it was, I was in uh, Albania, Moldavia, uh, but anyway, I, I saw the, the area right where she was born, but she had a, she had a, um, she had a, the, uh, this poem hanging on her wall, and it's just, it's the most important thing, and I have to read all the time, people are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered, love them anyway, if you do good, people will accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. The biggest men and women with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest man and woman with the smallest minds. Think big anyway. People favor underdogs but only but follow only top dogs. Fight for a few underdogs anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People really need help but may attack you if you do help them. Help them anyway. Give the world the best you have and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. And Mother uh, Mother Teresa, her version that she added, um, because at the end, it was never between you and them anyway. It was between you and God. Just mm-hmm. do good anyway. Mm-hmm. And I just think, again, I will stress till the day I die that that... You have to get rid of this human being thing because they're incomplete. Like, 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 like look at the, uh, you go to the zoo, a hundred percent of all the animals are naked. But if you went to the zoo naked, you'd be arrested and go to jail. You know what I mean? And, and you, you, um, if you go to a movie and Arnold Schwarzenegger pulls out a man-made machine gun and kills a hundred people, it's a family film. But if a woman would drop her shirt and nurse a child, it'd be rated R, and we'd have to cover the children's eyes. I mean, people yeah. are, at the end of the day, they're apes. They're monkeys without tails. They're extremely complex, and you just have to lower your expectations, love them to death, and I do love them. I mean, I would not want to be born on Earth and be the only human being. I just think that would be incredibly confusing mm-hmm. and lonely. And the only great thing about this planet is all the people on it, but then again, they're the worst part of the planet. I mean, uh, right now we're talking, we just had that episode in Paris, we always have wars, you know, pe- yeah. people are I- incredibly complex, but you just got to love them anyway. Awesome. I love it. I'm glad you included that in the book. It's, 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 there you buy, buying the book just for that. <laughs> Lots <laughs> of reasons to buy the book, and that's another one of them. Um, and of course, that it put the you know kicked you in the teeth. The the, the dental part it was uh, especially good for us dentists. That was that was pretty fun. Um, okay, another thing you talked about in your book was this um, this way of you explained a getting to yes method, and that you talked about in your book. I love the idea. You're collecting data. Your team is collecting data about the patients all day long, kind of an ongoing process. Can you tell me a little bit more about what spurred that and and what effect it's had? 
so what, what we see in a dental office is you know the a complete disconnect between the doctor who thinks she's patient centered, but she's not. I mean, dentists get up every morning, they go to the mirror, and they just you know their national anthem is me, 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 self, 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 me, me, self, self, me, 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 self, 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 me, and they'll call up the front office, and you know your your office hours are Monday through Thursday, eight to five. And the Federal Reserve is the largest employer of economists, and they said 100 million Americans have a job they can't leave Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and go to a doctor. 100 million. Mm -hmm. And their hours are Monday through Thursday, 5. And they'll be calling up, well, do you have any early morning or evening? No. Well, you should write that down. Lisa Knowles just called and asked if we have an early morning. And we said no. Well, are you ever open Saturday? No. Um, do you take Blue Cross Blue Shield? No. Um, do you, you know, they'll, they don't ha track any of these no's. And then there's a dentist in the back logging on to Dental Town saying, yeah, I need new patients. Um, should I do a flyer or should I do? And, and then they'll go to, they'll go to um, you know, the, the, the spear education and drop five grand on a weekend to treat the worn dentition. And it's like, and how many people asked you for that? How, how, how prevalent is this in your office? They go to Panky for six weeks to learn occlusion. And I'm sitting, and or the, now, now the big fat is sleep medicine, and but they have no data on what they should be making a supply of. Like, like how did I get into bleaching? So it was 1987. There was no over-the-counter bleaching. There was no professional bleaching. There was nothing. And this company, um, it was out of Arkansas. It was called uh, Omni Omni Company with uh, Omni White Bleaching. And the 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 Arizona rep was David Kill. He came by. And um, he told me all about it. It was like $900 for six bottles. And I just laughed and said no. But we had this prescription pad by the front desk. And it's getting to yes. And sure enough, out of nowhere, some girl called up and said, do you bleach uh, teeth? And then at the end of the month, I was looking at that. And I thought, okay, it's never happened in two years. And it was one. So that's an outlier. Mm -hmm. And then the next month, there was two. And I'm sitting there like, okay, 24 months, I never got this question. And then I got it one time, then I got it two times, then I'm like looking for that business card. Who, where the hell's that David, David guy that? again? <laughs> right. And I call him up, bought this stuff for $900 for six bottles, and I mean, it just exploded. So then all these dentists who were around were saying, well, you know, it's not ADA approved, there's no five-year research, uh, Gordon Christian hadn't even commented on it, and I'm just like, well, you know, none of those people pay my bills. Um, I'm a doctor, it's just carbamide peroxide, mm -hmm. um, the teeth are just elephant's tusk, and the patients are asking it, and I'm making bank on it. I think when we started, it was like, because it was 900 divided by 6 for a bottle, whatever that is, and I think at the time we were charging like four ninety nine. And and and, and it, I'll go back to, um, I'll go back to the Cirac. There, there, there's a circle, um, a circle of just dentists wanting to believe their own hype. All they talk about is that, you know, everybody wants a same-day crown. Really? I get like two humans a year that ask for that. <laughs> two. And, and you know, you know, the, if someone ever says same-day crown, it's a 99.999%. It's a Cirac doctor, okay? Right. The patients are asking me, how much does it cost? Yeah. Uh, do you take my insurance? Will I get a shot? Mm -hmm. uh, will it hurt? I mean, I mean, same day is so far down on the list um, that, um, you know, um, so, so the deal is to keep it real. I will always believe that in, um, in uh, you know, hockey, you want a great goalie. In football, you want a great quarterback. And whoever is answering that phone up front is the most important person in your office. And someday, a droid will do the root canals. Someday, <laughs> it will not even be a human that will go. I mean, you look at a CAD cam now and a CBCT and an iPhone stick all those three together and someday Obi-Wan Kenobi's going to walk in there or R2-D2 <laughs> and just sit down and, and just fix the whole damn too. I but hope you're so never, wrong on that one. I hope you're wrong on that one. <laughs> but what's never going to go away is that rocking hot receptionist that's intuitive and can feel and answer the phone and talk to the patient and get them to come in and sit in your chair and part with their cash yeah. so that you can fix their teeth. And if you get, if you have the best receptionist and the dentist is a cyclops with one eye, you got a million dollar practice. Yeah, that's so true. That's true. I mean, it just, it is about that. And I love that method. So if you don't know, because you, you know, you, you just mindlessly take those calls a lot of times and don't record it. And so that's it. I like that system. I, I think that more people did that, they benefit from just like you did. Um, 
Okay, so I have to ask you um, about your yoga workouts. Uh, you, men you mentioned that in your book. And um, I, I read that pretty much you get up, you exercise every morning, some form, some shape, whether it's yoga or running or, or um, what it might be. I know you just finished a, a Ironman again, I think. So congratulations on that. That's, that is a great routine. And I think you know that I'm a huge yoga fan and uh, practice pretty regularly too. And I really, I think we should just mandate this in dental school. It should just be part of the curriculum. Uh, what, do you, what do you get most out of yoga in your exercise routines? Well, I, I think that, um, can you turn the volume down a little more on me? Oh. I'm hearing myself back. Yep. I think I just get okay. too close to my oh, okay. area. So the bottom line is is the, the whole medical model for, you know, going back to the Egyptians and, you know, building the Chinese walls that you have something wrong and you go to a witch doctor and they only have two things. They cut something off or they give you a lotion and potion. And dentists, you hear them, and I was a victim of this, uh, my own thinking where, you know, when my lower back would hurt, I would go to a chiropractor because I, I, you know, you're going to go to a witch doctor and, and he would move you. Mm -hmm. uh, or dentists take ibuprofen or a carpal tunnel syndrome. You go mm -hmm. there and they, they, they cut into you and free up your tendons or whatever, whatever. And the bottom line is by, by 50, my, my neck was completely jacked. It was completely miserable. I was going to a chiropractor two or three times a week. And finally, one of my um, best friend, Dennis, uh, Tom Aaron, his wife just kind of snapped at me in my own garage and said, Howard, just go to yoga. <laughs> and so I, I, um, she said, I'll drive you. They have a class, a 7 p.m. class starting in 15 minutes. Let's just go to yoga right now. So we went to yoga, and we went there. It was 105 degrees for 90 minutes. You're stretching, and I mean, I felt instant relief. And 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 you got, you know, I, I I have a good friend that just had double carpal tunnel syndrome. Well, you know, no one will stand up to the doctor and say, "Dude, you're 60 years old, and you haven't done a single push up in 40 years." You think maybe if you just flattened your hand out on the floor and just did a flip and push up, you wouldn't have to go to a surgeon and get all cut up with a knife and pain pills. And and see, we want the doctor to move us from the outside in a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. They don't want to move from the inside out. And the mm -hmm. bottom line is. The worst thing about dentistry is we, we have a desk job. We sit in a chair all day. And yeah. how many patients, I'll never forget this patient, this good friend of mine, he, um, he was a heavy set dude for a long time. And he came in for a six month recall and it was just like a rocking hot body. And I'm just like, oh my God, Mike the man, what the hell did you do? Did you join him? No, he got, he was, he was depressed because he, he lost his high paying desk job. The only thing he could find was a construction job. He was hanging drywall oh. like eight to nine hours a day and lost a hundred pounds. Wow. And so he was making half the money and was twice as happy because he felt good. Yeah. And uh, so when you have a desk job like dentistry you, you, and you, you have to, you have to move your body. And I think that the, I'm addicted to the big room. I think if you sat on an ice rink, you couldn't stretch. Mm-hmm. So you're 98.63, so you go in a room that's 105, and for 90 minutes you start stretching, and I just notice a total difference in physical health and a total difference in mental health. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, that we're so constricted, and I, and I thought about that too, is that you know not only are we constricted physically in our chairs and bent over, but we're very constricted from a, you know, a mind standpoint. It's very tight. It's very focused. And uh, I, I'm always into the yin and yang type of uh, theory that you know we we're so we, we've got to have the opposite to to get that energy flowing again. And I, when I again, it was pain that drove me to yoga too. Um, but it, it makes us change, and so sometimes. But th some people will pick up a scalpel. You know, they think that's what's going to change them. They want somebody to change them. So. I appreciate that you're a fan of that and advocating it out there a little bit more. I think uh, I hope more dentists start out that way rather than end up that way. And save themselves a lot of grief, a lot of pain, uh, and suffering through their their dentistry. And you don't enjoy it. You know, when you're in pain, you don't enjoy dentistry. So, and and you know, healthcare is 17 cents of every dollar in America. And if you say anything like this, the whole society is going to say, "Oh, you're holistic. Oh, you're a nut job. Oh, you're a fruitcake. You know, be right. smart. Go to the doctor." Take the pharmaceutical pill. It's made by Pfizer. It's trading at $259 a share. I mean, <laughs> the whole society is just take the pill, yeah. uh, you know, surrender to the 400-pound gorilla who's a physician, and, and, and look at your physician. I mean, what percent of your physicians could not even run a 5K? Right. And well, that's the guy giving you a pill. Right. 
Yeah, it, it's a it's a messed up system, I, and I couldn't relent to that too. I kept um, trying to get my patients some help and sending them to their physicians. And find, you know, sometimes they would come back. And I'm not knocking. There's definitely a, a, I'm I'm a believer in research, and there's a place for medicine. And you know, bless the physicians for doing what they do in in certain situations. But, but I think you're right. We're missing that mark a lot um, when we could be <laughs> when we could just having people exercise more, eat better. Um, and, and you know what's, a, what's what's a crime is you know they, they took physical education out of all the high out of all the schools I know. and now when little Johnny's bouncing around now they say something's wrong with him so they want to give him a pharmaceutical pill because now he has ADD mm-hmm. whereas when we were little we had recess in the morning we had an hour lunch and recess and then we had a recess in the afternoon now you can't leave your desk and if you start jiggling or wiggling you need a, a, a medication and yeah. and why would physical ed not be in dental school when they've had the highest suicide rate five ten times in the last 30 years how come at 10 o'clock at dental school they said okay now it's dodgeball and now you get to throw your your <laughs> ball as hard as you can right at your teacher's face right i mean i mean what, what, you know the whole mindset is oh yeah just, um, oh yeah i mean i've, I've uh, talked a little bit i've done some speaking at the um UDM and U of M here on mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction. So, I mean, incorporating that and some yoga into the curriculum, I think, would be so powerful for the um, the graduates. They you need that. You need and that. look and look what and look what their report card is now. All the dental schools, every one of them out there, eighteen percent of their graduates will go to inpatient Betty Ford Center for ninety to hundred. Eighteen out of a hundred dentists will not retire before going to inpatient care and 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 where where is any mechanism to deal with I mean that's almost one in five. Yeah, holy cow. So so if you were the dean, if Lisa was the dean of school, I said, Lisa, you're gonna graduate a hundred kids and one in five will be in the Betty Ford Center. Yeah. It, can it's we, sad. can we can we teach them how to do something so that at the end of the night they don't have to go home and drink a twelve pack? Right. And I think I, I'm tired of the argument of well that's you you know dentistry attracts a compulsive personality or some type of personality and there's not a lot you can do and I say wrong you know a different answer come on give me something else that's that's ridiculous um so and, 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 and my best my best um speaker I ever heard oh I forgot his name who was the basketball coach you're basketball he was a basketball coach of the Miami Heat he'd been a couple of places a couple of champions he was the Miami he was a Tall basketball coach won a couple champions, and I think he was at the Lakers or somewhere else. Or uh, I don't know. I'm the name rec- recall is yeah, not my and biggest. And he stuff. he came to our dental so he actually came to the Arizona State Hygiene Association. It was like 20 years ago. And he says, "Look, this is what they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you that you know that when you're a dentist, it's always different for you because all your employees are women, or all all the dentists only got accepted to dental school because they got A's in math and physics and chemistry, and mm-hmm. they're not extroverts, not why." He goes, well, look at me. He goes, all my players are inner city African Americans. 90% of them didn't grow up with a dad, and their coach is a man. They'll they'll surrender to a dominant female figure without blinking, but when a man comes to them, they'll roll back their chest. They're ready to knock you out. He goes, everybody's coaching people with a background. He goes, my employees... When they were little, they didn't reach for a beer. They they reached for a joint. They didn't have a dad. They listened to their mom. Mm-hmm. They weren't afraid of their dad. They didn't know their dad, but their, their mom, they were scared to death. So everybody's got baggage, and we're all talking monkeys. So, it's yeah. again, it's an excuse that, oh, they're all women or, oh, we're all odds. The bottom line is, what, are, what do we got, and what are we going to do with it? And yeah. the deans are not addressing, they're not even talking about the fact that 18% of them will go to inpatient rehab. And it's a huge financial burden. I know a lot of the dentists. They had their practice paid off. They had their house paid off. But to keep their practice alive, you know, the, the Betty Ford Center is $1,000 a day for 120 days. So that's 120 grand. But you don't want to come back and have all your staff with new jobs. Right. So they literally had to go borrow a quarter million dollars to make payroll for four months so they could come back to a practice. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, the, the, those are the those are the big things, that the, the dust under the rugs that just gets swept away that I think we have to keep talking more about. And, and that, that's part of my communication background where I pushed to do what I'm doing too is, is that acknowledgement is we can't just keep pushing this under the rug. I'm, I'm tired of hearing about the the ASDA student who, you know, took her life or, you know, the dentist down the block took his life. That's just, and I know, and I know why, because it's competitive and it can be and it's stressful and it can be, uh, but with some tools and some guidance, 
there's so much more. There's so much more. And the, the, what the devastation that leaves behind is, is incredible. So um, I'm glad to... I'm glad to get some of this out there mainstream. And I know some people are like, oh, holistic too. And they start labeling you. And But I'm like, uh, that's all right. You can label. You can label me what you want. It's, it's treating the whole people, treating our whole selves as dentists too. And uh, it's going to pan out in the long run, I think. So anyways, okay, let me keep, let me give me, let me keep going here. Um, okay, so dentists in our stressful, busy, crazy lives, we're, we're, you know, we have lots to do. Why do you think dentists should take the time to read your book? I know we've recapped many crucial points today that I would just certainly buy it just knowing what we've talked about today. But what else? And why, why do you think it's important for them to take the time to read your book? And then where, where are they going to find it? Where can they go buy it? Uh, they can buy it on Amazon, uh, Amazon.com. But, um, you know, the bottom line is, you know, when I was in dental school and the uh, undergrads were coming in and you were meeting with them, you were being like, say, you know, why did you want to be a dentist? And, you know, they'd give you all these phony answers like, well, you know, I really like to work on my hands. Well, hey, I'll save you four years of college and a couple hundred thousand dollars. Go get a job, you know, laying bricks. I mean, you know, you, they say, well, I don't think I want to be an orthodontist. I like being with bending wires. Well, then go be an electrician. You don't need to go to four years of dental school to bend a wire. You know, yeah. I, I think everybody that said, I'm going to go into delayed gratification, I'm not going to earn money now, and I'm going to go be a dentist, a physician, a lawyer, an engineer, because I want to have more money uh, later. I want to return on my investment. And they're paying, you know, seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year for dental school. And you're not going to learn any business in business school. And I want to tell you that the, the, the richest dentists in the world haven't touched patients in 10, 20, 30 years. I still treat patients only because I like it. Mm -hmm. I love pulling wisdom teeth the most. I love molar endo. I'd rather do a retreat molar than, a, 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 you know, I, I don't want to do a, a root canal number eight. I think the assistant <laughs> should do all the single canals. Um, you know, I, I love working with my hands on patients, the challenge. my Probably the funnest thing I do is when you... Um, pull a tooth on a baby and they don't know it and then you go tell the baby that you're not going to pull it today and go get this to mother then I walk the baby out in the waiting room and the little kid says well he's not going to pull my tooth today and I'm supposed to give you this and the mom looks in there and realizes oh my god he pulled her tooth and she doesn't even know it and <laughs> she's pretty biting gratifying. so, so I, I, I love that yeah. but that has nothing to do with having a very successful business and like say, I call it managing from the grave, the, the greatest companies in the world, their founders are all dead, whether it's Ford or McDonald's or Walmart or whatever. And <clears throat> if you learn how to manage the business, you'll make so much money, then you don't have to do dentistry to make uh, a certain amount of minimum monthly payments and, and living behind the gun. Dentistry is stressful enough without having the financial stress. And I think dentistry yeah. is far more fun when you're rich. And when, you, when you're rich and you do it, it's fun. But if you have to do it every day, month after month, year after year, um, and like say, uh, they, they got no training, and, and the, the, the ones that are crushing it, I'd say the number one thing the ones crushing it have in common is their mom and dad owned a business, whether that was a farm, a restaurant. Mm -hmm. But there's so many dentists where mom stayed home and made Catholic cookies every day, and dad worked at, on the line at GM. And they get made all the way to a physician, a dentist, a lawyer, and they don't know the first thing about business. In fact, mm -hmm. I fly, I lecture so much, I, I'm always in, um, bumped up to first class with all my miles and everything. I've sat by three U.S. senators in my, um, in my career, and talking to them on the plane, you realize just they're lawyers. They didn't know business 101 they didn't know economics 101 one of them you remember the big deal the balance budget act by graham redmond mm -hmm. i mean i sat by graham and i had him autograph one of my books the guy couldn't tell you the first thing about accounting and it'd be, but, but but since he's a lawyer he thought he was the smartest man in the world right and so i just try to get dennis to just you know just skip one bone grafting course and just read my book and learn how to just sit there and crush it on the business side yeah. Then you'll be bone grafting implants. That's your hobby. I mean, some people make wooden bowls, some golf, some fish. I like to pull wisdom teeth and do root canals. Uh, but, you know, just separate all those dreams from money, you know. And, and the, the other thing is um, 3% of millionaires, 3% of Americans' households. There's uh, 330 million people living in 100 million households, and three out of every 100, they're, they're millionaires. So I always tell Dennis, dude, if three out of every 100 houses can be a millionaire, why the hell can't you? I mean, you know the Krebs cycle, geometry. You, you know you have the brain. You just haven't committed to just doing it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And just, just get the millionaire thing down, and then everything else is real easy. It does make business a lot more um, easier, and when you don't have that financial burden. I know when I paid off all my debt, it was kind of a little personal goal by 40, and I reached that, and I was like, ah, wow, you know, now what? Are we, now what? And we're going to do some of these other things. And it's, um, it is more fun when you don't have that big burden. And, and that's why I can, it is a concern with those students walking away with so much debt right now um, and with no business skills to pair with that. That's even scarier, right? Both the, the combination. So um, read Howard Ferran's book. Uh, get your business going. That's what I could tell the younger dentists or the older dentists who just never really took much of an interest in business or you better hire well, right? <laughs> Hire somebody who really enjoys the business side of dentistry and that you can trust. So, anyways, I, I appreciate your time today. I'm gonna wrap it up today. If there's uh, any last thoughts or anything else you'd like to uh, tell anybody listening out there, we'd appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much for your your time today. So, any any final thoughts? Oh uh, well, it was an honor to be on your show. Um, I'm a big fan. You're a prolific writer. I mean, every time I turn around. Uh, on Dental Town, LinkedIn, Facebook. Yeah, I mean, I think you write some amazing stuff. So it's, it's a real honor that you uh, invited me on your show. Oh, well, thank you. We went beyond 32 teeth today, didn't we? And that's kind of the fun. That's where I enjoy it. And we'll this will be a good blog post. So can't wait to see it up there. So thank you so much, Howard.